You may have expressed yourself or seen another person say things such as, Christians are self-righteous, judgmental hypocrites. The statement has truth to it, but also falsehood. First, I think it's good to define the words in the prior statement. Sadly, people misuse words, use later modified definitions, or just make up definitions that suit their own purposes. First of all, we should ask, what is a Christian? The word Christian was invented to describe people who learned and attempted to live the teachings of Jesus the Christ. So if a person does not strive to follow Jesus' teaching, they are not a Christian. They may be saved, but they are not a Christian. So being a Christian is not based on what one believes, but on what one does. When it comes to being self-righteous, defining this phrase is difficult and open to opinion. Webster's Dictionary defines righteous as morally justified. If we put that together with self, it could mean one morally justified according to their opinion. Or, the first thought that I had was, a righteousness that comes from one's own labor. This is certainly not why Christians are referred to as righteous. For example, the Apostle Paul said the following about some Israelites. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. The only reason Christians are righteous is because God gave them his own perfect righteousness as a gift. The gift is nothing they earn, but is given out of God's mercy. One dictionary I stumbled across that defines phrases defines self-righteous as having or characterized by a certainty especially an unfounded one, that one is totally correct or morally superior. People should realize that Christians don't make up such certainties on their own. They are simply trusting in what they believe God has revealed. So the certainty they portray is not in themselves, but in God. By this definition, I guess a person who is certain that the universe came into existence through the Big Bang could be called self-righteous. But obviously this definition is open to much interpretation. Now about Christians being judgmental, this is true. But contrary to popular belief, Jesus actually commanded his followers to judge people. A verse that a lot of non-Christian people have memorized is where Jesus said, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Many people, Christians included, may be ignorant of where Jesus also said, Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. This verse shows us that the judging Jesus was against was judging by appearance, and if people read the verse following Matthew 7-1, they would see Jesus was speaking of hypocritical judgment. So when the saints judge hypocritically or by appearance, they are not following Christ and are thus not Christians at that moment. And the final point is hypocrisy. I just touched on hypocrisy, so no new explanation is needed. The saints definitely can be hypocrites, and allow me to expose one avenue of hypocrisy that is obvious today. Jesus told his followers, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. A person who calls themselves a Christian and fails to preach the gospel is indeed a hypocrite. So a Christian that does not obey Christ is an oxymoron. It's like saying that pacifists endorse war. Those who have been saved have the same problems as the unsaved and are no better, just better off. The only reason they are better off is because they have humbled themselves before God and accepted his gift of salvation. You ever thought that there are people that have gone to hell today that never thought they would go there? I mean, they might have thought they would go there, but they never really believed that they would go to hell. They never actually knew what hell was going to be like. They never actually believed that they would someday go there. They probably thought they were good, you know. I mean, after all, they're Christians. Of course they never thought they were going to go there, but they're there right now. 
Many of them cursing God because some preacher told them that God was love and that love was tolerance and that God would never make them feel condemned. Ever heard the phrase, a little sugar makes the medicine go down? More like a little truth makes deception acceptable. I want to be very clear on something. I have a heart for every soul lost and saved. But this video, from the very first idea of it until the very last edit that I made, was made for church people. I've spoken out in the past, and I think it's funny because a lot of church people have come up to me and they say, you're going to turn all the lost people off, or you're going to make sinners want to have nothing to do with you. They miss the whole point. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to church people. The people that already think they believe in Christ. The people that serve in churches. The people that evangelize the lost. The people of the church. You know, I'm going to tell you something. It is an absolute, no second question, no explanation, no hearing of your life story, impossibility for you to be saved and yet live in a continuous state of worldliness. And you say things like, God will forgive me. God has been with me since I was a kid. After all, I got saved a long time ago. Surely he will just forget about all this. And you say things like that, but you keep on doing all of the evil you can. You intentionally indulge in your favorite sin. And while there's still time to stop, while there's still time for you to just think about it and say, no, I don't want to do it. In the same breath you say, boy, I'm sure glad God is merciful. But Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, looks down from heaven and he says, do you have any idea what your forgiveness cost me? I had flesh torn off my neck and back and legs. I had a crown of thorns jammed into my head. I was stabbed in the side. Gore gushed from my hands and from my feet and from my back just to cover the thing that you were so lightly indulging in. But in truth, these things that I went through in the physical, they were nothing compared to what I was going through in the spiritual. If you multiplied all of these physical things that I had gone through times a thousand, it still could not cover your one sin. Don't you know? But God the Father beat me to pieces. He obliterated me beyond recognition. He took the cup of wrath that had your name on it, and he splashed it onto my perfectly sinless and bleeding face. And what's worse is that God did this to me with a smile. It pleased him to crush me for you. That's what your forgiveness cost me. Most professing Christians have never realized their actual need for Christ. They've been invited to come to Him in such a way that it seems like, well, I'm doing God a favor just to believe in Christ. They've never been told that the very first level of Christianity is a complete denial of all of your desires and of everything that you've ever been. They've not been clearly shown that whosoever does not wake up in the morning and die to every one of his desires is not even worthy of walking in Jesus' footsteps. They don't understand that being a Christian means that they are crucified to the world and that the world is crucified to them. That means that the world thinks of you as a fool that has nothing to contribute to society and that there is nothing that the world offers that you could desire. That you now have nothing to do with sin and everything to do with God. It hasn't been told to very many professing Christians that Jesus said and meant no one can serve two masters. You will hate one and you will love the other every time. If you do not mind it very much when people use his glorious name in vain, if you do not mind being seen in places that were built to be places of sin, if you do not feel deeply offended at the fornications in your favorite movies, at the scoffing of the glorious name of Jesus, and at jokes that defy his very throne and slap his face in rebellion, then you hate him. And it's really not hard to figure out because Jesus said, you will hate one and love the other always. If you love the world, you hate him, or else Jesus was wrong. But you say, no, that ain't true. I love Jesus. Jesus is Lord. But who are you trying to convince? Isn't it interesting when anyone brings a word of correction about your sin, you immediately pass them off as unchristlike and judgmental. It's disgusting that it's more of a scandal in this church culture to reprove sin than it is to laugh at it. The one who says sin is wrong is judgmental, and the one who commits it and encourages others to do it is Christ-like. How disgusting. You don't want to be like God. You just want people to back off when they start reproving the thing that you were the most in love with. True love for God means true hatred of sin. In Matthew 7 and in Luke 13, Jesus says that many will be telling him on that day that he is the actual Lord of their life, but he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Your professed faith in Jesus means absolutely nothing. You say, well, you know, Nate, you really can't just judge a book by its cover. Well, I heard a great preacher recently say that that whole idea is really an invent of Satan because Jesus said you can judge a book by its cover because in John 15 he said you will know false prophets by their fruit. Tell me, how long would it actually take you if you walked up to an apple tree and there were fruits of apples all over it for you to say that it was an apple tree. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. 
and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire. No one has to hear what you've been through. No one has to know that at one point you got saved. All they have to do is look at your fruit. You've been serving in church your whole life, but look at your fruit for a second. What are the things that come out of your mouth when you talk to people in conversations? What are your affections set toward? Are they God things? You can tell him that you've served in church. You can tell him that he's Lord. But if you die without bearing Christ's fruits, you will go to hell for all of eternity. And 10 million years will pass. And you'll be under the weight of this thing that no human on earth can bear for even a second. And it'll be like no time has passed in eternity. No time. 100 million years passes and it's the same. You're there. There you are suffering the wrath of God because you believe some lying preacher that was a wolf in sheep's clothing that just tried to encourage you. And so you may be saying, as many already have, hey, you're judgmental. You're unchristlike. You're condescending. You're heavy. You're turning people off by the way that you talk. Can't you see? But I want you to live. That is the main purpose of your existence, to live. That is God's number one desire. The biggest problem in the Bible, if you would read it, that God is faced with, is that if He is just, He cannot forgive you. Go talk to the lost people on the streets and see if they don't tell you that God is forgiving. They've heard of the tremendous love of God, and yet they're still in love with the very sin that crushed and murdered Him. And so are many of you. Hey, let's watch a movie tonight. What, there's nudity and there's 12 GDs? 140 F words? That's alright. I have freedom in Christ. Freedom from what? Freedom to let some of the worst words that can spill out of a human mouth serve as your entertainment? And yet you still claim that you love Him with your whole heart? You make lighthearted gestures at the very things that murdered Him? And not only that, but you spit in the bloody face of the Lamb of God as He hangs on the jagged wood, taking your wrath. And you say, don't worry. He forgives. Do you know the character of the God you serve? In the book of Jeremiah, God's people have been wicked by serving other gods and having their affections set on other things and willfully sinning and not saying that they had sinned and not acknowledging their need for God. So we find Jeremiah in chapter 14 repenting, genuine biblical repentance for the people of God. And he said, Lord, we confess our wickedness and that of our ancestors too. We have all sinned against you. For the sake of your reputation, Lord, do not abandon us. Do not disgrace your own glorious throne. Please remember us and do not break your covenant it with us. It's really good repentance. It's really genuine. It's better than what most of you have prayed. But what may shock you is God's response. Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me pleading for these people, I wouldn't help them. Away with them. Get them out of my sight. And then he told Jeremiah, do not go to funerals to mourn and show sympathy for these people, for I have removed my peace and my protection from them. I have taken away my unfailing love and mercy. These weren't the lost people of the world, these were his people. So you may be questioning, Nate, why are you saying this? To me, you still sound judgmental. Well, I heard a story of a young man that was dying on his deathbed, and his brother was there next to him. And he said, Brother, why have you been so indifferent to me about my soul as you have been? And his brother said, Indifferent? I haven't been indifferent to you. I, I've spoken to you often about it. And the brother said, Yeah, you've spoken. But I think that if you would have remembered that I was going down to hell, you would have been more earnest with me. Every time you hear a sermon and you see a video or you hear a song that's convicting or anything, you have a chance to either repent or to harden your heart. Some of you have watched a video that I've made in the past and you've thought, man, that's really good. Or, or maybe you've told me, hey, I'm going to start changing. Thank you for this and this. But you really haven't decided to go ahead and change and tap into the grace of God. You're hardening your heart against Him. You're making it harder for yourself. Don't make your judgment twice as bad for hearing the word of the Lord and then ignoring it. I'm telling you about hell and I'm telling you that some of you are going to go there unless you repent. But if you harden your heart and you live your whole life and you die and go to hell without repenting, you will look back on the day that you watch this video and from the flames of hell you will curse you will curse the day you were born you will curse this day and you will say I wish I had never even watched that because now I know that he was right now I know that this hell is real that he wasn't just trying to scare me and that I was going I was going to burn there for all of eternity now I see the truth now I see I've got to tell you something very solemn there's nothing in this life that you can do that will take away glory from God. And in the end, He will be glorified in your life. There's a verse of scripture that talks about how for all of eternity, 
the lake of fire will be open for people to come and see the fierce wrath of God. And they will be able to observe how majestic He is and they will see it with awe in their hearts and they will come back and worship Him. The Lion of God who stomps His enemies until their blood sprinkles all of His robes, they will come bow before Him and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. But you know what mercy is? Mercy is that you can choose. And so you choose. Will God be glorified by your damnation and eternal punishment? Or will He be glorified by your salvation and your worship? I realize that a lot of you think I'm crazy. I was told that. But just ask yourself, what is going to matter when you are on your deathbed, if you get one, and when you're just a few breaths away from death? What is going to matter? Is it going to matter whether or not you've graduated from college? No. Is it going to matter whether or not I've written a song or whether or not I've uh, painted a picture or done anything? Nothing's going to matter when your breath's away from eternity. Don't you think that you'll wish when that time comes that you had really loved God the way you said you did? That you'd actually flip the TV off a little more to study His God-breathed scriptures? I know I will. No matter how much I've done it, I'll know that I wish I would have done it more. But the good news is... Christ is calling. He's calling loud. Wisdom is calling out in the streets. He's calling for you to come. He is holding the door of mercy as wide open as it can go. And He is saying, come and dine with me. To dine with Him, you have to die to you. The one whose name you abuse and whose cross you mock by the way that you live is alive and He's coming. But you may die before He does. All you have is now. Chapter 17 These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, 
and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Hi, saints. Um, I just wanted to go over a few things with you. A lot of you have been sending, um, I'm at work right now. A lot of you have been sending emails um, saying that you're feeling some kind of weariness in your spirit. And uh, it's because one of the things that you're feeling like that is because you're being heavily persecuted. Sorry about the distraction by false prophets. Now, Jesus did prophesy this. It was going to get a little... It's actually going to get worse. Look, um, I'm getting persecuted even now. Um, I'll give you an example. Okay, this is a person I already exposed. Uh, false prophet Daniel E. Morales put up two more slanderous videos about me saying I had a lot more channels and it's been proven wrong. Um, his basis is because the other channels use some of my videos because they use my videos that my channel that 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 channel is mine which it's not that sounds stupid um lots of people put their videos in creative commons right anybody can put their videos in creative commons anyone and anybody can use their stuff it doesn't mean that you're that person and and that doesn't prove you know it doesn't mean you're that person so for example you can put your video in creative commons and i can decide to use it like I did with another watchman, I used their video and he was a guy and people thought I was a brother instead of a sister. So, um, that's his whole basis. So he's still a slandering and guys and girls, I'm still here. And he's, he's psychotic and bipolar. I'm going to tell you something real quick. He put up a video just now saying that he was going to leave YouTube. It's a common Jezebel tactic that, um false prophets do to gain attention and sympathy they will put up a false they will put up a video saying that they're going to leave youtube and by the time you know it they'll come back three days later so look out for that if you see him come back three to four days later saying you know on youtube or even a month or two months then you know he's a liar okay so um i just wanted to give you that as an example that i'm facing persecution like that slanderous videos, lies from all these false prophets I exposed. You know, they're fighting inner demons and it's what it is. You know, you guys are telling me that you're getting heavily attacked by false prophets as well that you exposed. The only thing is watchmen that we can do is just stay bold and move forward. And like I said, the whole thing with the channels, you already know I have End Times Deliverance, Watch for Jesus 777 and a fourth backup channel I'm not going to disclose that name because I use that to put my um, videos of false prophets I expose so it doesn't get falsely flagged for copyright or whatever. <clears throat> so, you know, even now I'm getting slandered. Some of you guys, a lot of you actually are telling me you're getting slandered. Don't worry about the names. Just ignore them. They're trolls and they're demons and false prophets and they need Jesus Christ to fix them. So, you know... It's what it is. So I'm still here. I don't care what they say. I encourage you guys to adopt the same attitude. Do not care what people think. You know that it's lies. It's, you know, slander. And, um, you know, we, we need to be about a father's business. You know, bringing souls to Christ. And uh, winning souls to the kingdom of heaven in these last days. With that, I also want to share a dream with you. Um, I had a dream, okay, another out-of-body experience, where 
um, I saw myself again sleeping on my bed and there was a bright light in my room and it was a man but I couldn't see his face and he extended his hand out to me and I was taken to I believe what was the tribulation because I saw Christians in hiding again and those that were discovered were being rounded up and sent to detention camps now I don't know if the rapture happened I really don't but I know that these Christians were sent to detention camps as um, I guess to be re-educated to adopt the evil moral morals of society and then I was taken to another part where I was in a diner in a restaurant and again I again I believe the Lord Jesus Christ took me and was showing me these things and he was beside me and he pointed to the TV screen and on there it said that millions of people were missing and that there was chaos worldwide obviously that meant that the rapture took place then I was taken back into my house into my bedroom and I could see myself sleeping and the Lord told me to warn my people that I'm coming and he knows those who are of him and those that are of not and then he said those that curse thee I will curse them he's talking about his true watchman on the wall and um, he said uh, you will be hated for my namesake now I remember in the dream that I had tears in my eyes and I'm only telling you what I remember and um, Lord told me that I was he was holding me and you guys the watchman the true watchman in his right hand and not to worry that he was going to um, take revenge for us I did hear the Lord say he wasn't pleased and that we didn't have that much time and whatever time we had left that to warn his people to let others know about his son Jesus and then I was, I woke up. I wanted to share that with you. Anyway, sorry about the background noise. God bless. You're gonna last forever. You're gonna be for. You're gonna be an eternal person. You need to to know this. You need to. You'll go wandering off if you don't. You need to stick with Jesus, and you do that by believing in Him. And this is important. These people didn't want Paul telling about Jesus. So they persecuted him through political means. They knew who, they knew who to go to. So what did Paul do? Shake the dust off and leave. About shaking the dust, Clark says, the Jews, when traveling in pagan lands, took care when they came to the borders of their own country to shake off the dust of their feet, lest any of the unhallowed ground should defile the sacred land of Israel. Now that's what they did. That was a practice. You get that? Oh, I was just over in the next country. I'm going to go home. Oh, I can't take any of that country with me. I'm shaking it off because that country's cursed and I'm going into the land of Israel. Paul now applies this very tradition to the Jews who rejected Jesus. Guess who else did this? Jesus himself in Matthew 10, 14. He said he sent them out in all the towns of Israel. He sent 70 of them all in towns of Israel. And he said, if they reject you, shake the dust off your clothes and your feet of that town or city. Did you hear that? Do you, you, you get it? When Jesus told the disciples to sh shake the dust off their feet when in a 
town in Israel, if they rejected Jesus, he was really saying that without faith in Christ, that land was defiled. That goes against flies in the face of a lot of stuff we hear today. All we hear about in, an event, in, 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 in evangelical circles is the Holy Land, the Holy Land, the Holy Land. Listen to me. You make Jesus an extra additiveness, someone alongside, you're wrong. Jesus is everything. He's just not, it's not Israel and Jesus. This is important. This takes away the glory of Jesus. It takes away the truth of the gospel. It's Jesus. He's the reason that that land was holy. And if you don't believe in him, the dust gets shaken off you, the clothes. What is that saying? Defiled land. Without faith in Jesus as Savior of the world, the land of Israel is cursed, not holy. There, I said it. I guess I'm going to be losing a lot of friends, but I don't care. Listen, to shake the dust off is to say that your land is cursed. That was the practice. Jesus told his disciples to shake the dust off any town in Israel that rejected Jesus as Savior. If your house rejects salvation by grace, it is cursed. If your city rejects salvation by Jesus, it is cursed. Even an Israeli city. This is not to say that those in a cursed house or city cannot be saved. But the presence of the accepted gospel in a house or a city or a nation will result in the blessing of God spreading out his salvation unhindered in that place. But when Jesus is excluded from these places, salvation is hard to come by. Now you think of Washington, D.C. when you hear about this. Let's just kick God out. And it's not just there. It's all public places. They're ungodly opposers of Jesus when they do that. And there were 13 chapels in the House of Representatives when John Quincy Adams went to church five times a Sunday. They're godless and they're, you're going to get their, their land cursed. And it doesn't mean there's no Christians around, but it's going to be a dearth. Without faith in Jesus, your land is cursed. The entire area of Israel was holy in anticipation of the first coming of Jesus. Now that Jesus has come, one must believe in him in order to not be cursed or have the dirt shaken off. The next time you read this verse, shake the dust off of that city off of you. Remember what it means and who it was applied to. We, don't, we just read that, oh, okay, well that's some kind of flamboyant way Jesus made it up. No, he didn't make that up. That was a practice. That's what they did. And him telling you, he turned it around on them. I know you're Abraham's seed, but you're not my children. You're, your father is the devil. That's what he said. Read the Gospels. It's all over. People are denying Christ today and upholding Israel when Israel can't save them and it's bad for Israel. Why don't you tell them they need Jesus so that they can be saved too, these pastors. Okay, got my dander up a little here. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to finish up very quickly. Okay. <clears throat> the Christ-denying teachers who lift up Israel while Israel is in a state of unbelief will not adhere to these truths. Okay, can someone read verse 52, please? Amen. Those Antichrist people kicked Paul out of their region, but they did not kick the gospel out. The gospel was still there, but it was being held down, even though Paul was kicked out. So the region had an element of the blessing, but if the leaders would have received the truth, like on that island of Cyprus, remember that leader received it? If they would have received the truth, the gospel would have spread like wildfire. Today, the U.S. government is hindering the message of Christ any way it can. These leaders are holding down the truth 
and will be punished by God most severely. You hear that any, any person out there that's doing that? Get it. Paul wasn't there anymore. He left that place without its dust. The believers were there, and the Gentiles were the ones who were glad and who were happy about the message. It says it right here, right? We just read it. Paul and the boys were filled with joy too. Jesus said that if we are persecuted, we should be happy. This is what they were experiencing. Paul and the others knew that though the world rejected them, yet God would accept them. This is carrying your cross. The cross isn't given us to us by God. It's a rejection of the world. And, and whatever kind of persecution comes from that rejection. The cross is not from God. Many Christians today think that the cross is the way you follow Jesus. Let me deny myself with everything. I can't have ice cream. They mistakenly believe that if they suffer for God, God must accept them. That's another denial of Jesus. God does not give us the cross to carry. The world does. And when you realize that if you're being hated because of Jesus and you're carrying your cross, that, that all of a sudden makes you like almost uh, endure it better. You know, it's because of him. It's so unjust. This lover of their own souls. And that's why I'm being persecuted. It makes you be more forgiving. In this sense, the cross means hard times. Not in Jesus' sense. The cross for Jesus is a redemption. Our cross is just a result of our redemption. When evil people hate us because of Christ. So as a Christian, when someone persecutes you, rejoice. Be filled with exceeding gladness. It is Satan in them that hates the Holy Spirit in you. But be not afraid, for great is, is he who is in you than he who is in this world. Amen.